worked uh, I've worked as a um, with a uh, like a, a data lake kind of team with Kotlin, and um, now I currently work within a, a rating calculation team uh, in the back end of insurance calculation. So I'm just going to get started from a very low basis. Um, for web, like I said, I haven't seen coroutines used a lot. Uh, I'm sure it's used a lot in Android. But coroutines are lightweight threads uh, that is defined by the Kotlin developers. It's a technique used for asynchronous and non blocking programming. And it's an alternative to threads directly or call to action features uh, promises. So why use coroutines? Uh, they improve the performance of your application. Uh, they are easier to read and maintain, and testing is pretty straightforward. From my first experience using color routines, I was a little daunted by the testing piece of it, understanding how to how to essentially mock and see how color routines are interacting and working with our threads in our application. And it's also just built around a simple construct to suspend. Uh, which basically tells the compiler that if this function is a coroutine or a asynchronous running, or it's, it's able to run asynchronously. And on the bottom right of the slide, you can see a code snippet of a normal function calculate or a suspended function count, which is going to be used in our example, one of our examples today. So I'm going to quickly jump to a quick demo of why uh, coroutines are so light and efficient. And I have this small little program right here. Murphy's Law, I'm gonna love it. <laughs> if it uh, freezes up. Well, I'll explain it while my computer is doing its thing. Uh, it's a, it's basically a small little function that's gonna generate 100,000 coroutines, and it's gonna just print out a simple dot. Um, there we go. And it, I pulled this straight from Kotlin's website on uh, an example of this, but if this was done in basic threads, uh, it would probably run into memory issues. So, run it. Oh, yes. yes. Thank you for reminding me. That looks good. So, if I run this, you'll see it's going to print up a bunch of dots and return. If I would have run that in threads, it would have probably run into memory issues and would have been a lot more rough over going. Then I jump in the back. Okay, so uh, back to what are coroutines. Coroutines live within a coroutine scope. Um, that coroutine scope is the outermost uh, piece of the coroutine, and it's made of a coroutine construct or context, uh, which is a set of elements that perform a certain job of the coroutine. And that coroutine context contains a bunch of uh, dispatchers that have uh, coroutine builders that, are, that actually create the actual. Uh, that do the actual processes that are happening inside of it. Um, diving in on dispatchers now, uh, there are multiple types of dispatchers and each one of them perform their own specific job. Uh, the first one is of the default dispatcher. It's how we use for CPU operations on the main thread. Uh, examples are live calculations and transformations of data. And on the right you can see just how you would tell the launch or the, the coroutine builder how to actually, or which dispatcher it should be using. Uh, the next one is the main dispatcher, and the main dispatcher is used for simple operations. Um, for Android, that would be uh, the view and things of those sorts. The next one would be the I.O. dispatcher, and the I.O. dispatcher is just used for network calls. Um, it's primarily made for that. And then the last one is the unconfirmed dispatcher. The unconfirmed dispatcher is kind of like a rogue dispatcher. It does what it wants because it doesn't care about the scope that it lives within. It's kind of on a global piece of it. And there's a global scope that we're going to dive into later, but the global scope is very similar to the unconfirmed dispatcher where it basically just runs on its own thread that doesn't listen to it, or it's not incorporated as part of the coroutine scope that it's, even if it's necessary with that. Okay. Um, so, coroutine, or specified coroutine, yeah. So, a difference between web and Android here is that in web there's no, uh, there's no view that we have to worry about. We don't have to worry about our application not loading slowly. There's a separate UI that's obviously going to be dealing with that sort of uh, work. So, 
on a, in the context of dispatchers and web, uh, we don't have to actually worry about them. And actually, the main dispatcher is not even available. If you try to run an uh, asynchronous coroutine with the main dispatcher, um, it's, gonna, it's not going to run. And you can see in the bottom, uh, the bottom uh, example here, the launch is not specifying, so it's just going to conform to the scope that it's uh, inheriting from its parent. Coroutine context is an immutable representation of the coroutine. Um, it contains a set of elements that include the job of it, and it exists within the coroutine scope. The scope is, uh, it, it encapsulates everything within it, it's kind of the outermost piece of it. And you can see in my code snippet on the right side here that uh, the coroutine scope is launching a builder, and we have two examples where it's using global scope and a non-global one. So the, the top uh, builder here would confine to the uh, the top one on line 124 here would confine to the context or the scope of the uh, scope defined on 123 versus uh, the global scope launch would not care about that and um, it would basically run until it's completed its job regardless of the term or the program terminates or not. So and if the program terminates, it's obviously not going to complete its job. All right, so I got a quick little global scope demo here. I'm gonna dive a little bit more in on it, but let's hope I don't get a beach ball this time. Okay, so okay, so right here's an example of what happens if you try to run a global scope dot launch and uh, within a run block. So this run block is basically gonna tell us that we can run this non or this this core routine within this main here, but What's going to happen is that this is going to run, and the or the, the program isn't going to wait for all 1,000 lines to be printed out. So if I run this here, so it's going to say I'm sleeping zero one two and cancel because it's away 1,300 milliseconds. Let's jump back again. And so here's a visual of what I'm explaining here. Uh, well, coroutine scope is the outermost bound. It contains a context, which contains a set of dispatchers that need to be, uh, that basically dispatch uh, do the job that it's trying to perform. And there could be multiple, or there could be nested scopes within that, et cetera, et cetera, with more dispatchers and whatnot. So we're going to get started with an example. Uh, the first part is that uh, you're going to have to import coroutines into your project. I've included in Maven and Gradle import here, and an import to your basic calculator that we're going to be using today, for our example. Uh, here's a little diagram of what our uh, example looks like at the moment. You can, you can assume that this is divided into columns where each column is a time, how long it's going to take. And we are going to perform three calculations. And each calculation is going to have a background process that I'm simulating here that's essentially just delaying. And it's going to eventually return the sum of those calculations. And so right now, it's in a very water quality kind of syn or synchronous uh, running way that it's being run right now. And we're going to change this to be asynchronously running, just like this. So you can see that we divide that into enough more columns. Um, it's going to run much faster. And here's our sample code. Uh, that looks big enough. And you can see on lines 6 through 8, uh, we're doing three calculations, and it's just going to get the sum of them. Um, that's defined on line 11. So the cal the, those calc functions don't actually do anything except call a thread.sleep, and that's just going to tell our program to pause for a moment and um, just wait for that given time to complete. And finally, it just prints out uh, the value and the duration that it took. And so when we run this, we're going to get an output of 30, 20, 10 that directly is synchronous with the 6, 7, and 8 lines. When in reality, if this was an asynchronous, we would be seeing this print out as 10, 20, 30. Okay, so let's get started with converting this to coroutines. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to import our uh, the coroutine library into our, our function here, our file. And we're going to replace thread.sleep with delay. And 
delay is just a coroutine function uh, that does the same thing as sleep. So, and you can see here we're running into compiler, um, and if we take a look at what the error is, it's saying, oh, this needs to be a suspending function. And suspending functions are what allows us to be able to run coroutines. They define, they tell the compiler that this is going to be an asynchronous running uh, function here. And so to fix this, we just simply add that tag to the beginning of the function. And so we run into an issue with this if we want to just convert everything to suspending functions because we can't we can't change our main into a suspend. And we got to be able to tell the uh, tell the compiler how we're going to be running this asynchronously. It is we need more context to give to it. So we see here that now that we can change our calc function on line 16 to a suspend, now our main our three calc calls at 7, 8, and 9 are all causing errors. This is where I want to reintroduce run blocking. Run blocking allows you to call suspending functions. Um, it's, it basically interrupts, it bridges that gap between not suspending and suspending functions. And it, what it does is it basically will interrupt and block the main thread from continuing before all asynchronous coroutines within it have completed. But just be wary that if you you don't want to be throwing this around everywhere. You want to make sure that this is, you push this as high up in your application as you possibly can. If you don't, you're going to run into issues down the road with scope, and especially when it comes to testing um, and things of that nature. So here you can see in our uh, example, we added run blocking to the beginning of it. And now everything is encapsulated in this run block, and we're not running into any sort of compiler errors. But you can see here our output is still reading 30, 20, 10. We're not actually running asynchronously. Uh, we need still more context to be able to tell how to run these and what needs to actually run asynchronously. Simply adding suspend is not going to just make a, a function run asynchronously. So, so, right. so just like I said, doesn't make it asynchronous alone. We need to specify a coroutine to launch it in its own scope, which brings me to launch. We can replace run blocking with global scope.launch because it allows you to run the suspended functions uh, inside of your regular one, just like run blocking, and it does not block the main thread. However, when we run this code as is, uh, we're going to run into another issue where the code completely skips over, just like in my previous live demo of global scope. And you can see here that the value return is still, you can still see it's an active uh, coroutine that's running, and our duration is only a couple milliseconds. Um, so the return value of a launch is a job, which is a cancel, cancelable thing. And it basically, uh, yeah, it is a return from what the uh, launch has. And you can, uh, you can wait, you can tell the program to wait for a job by calling job.join. Um, so if we split our calculations here into each in, each individual launches, uh, we'll be able to tell, this, this basically tells the compiler that, okay, these are going to each run individually and asynchronously. But we need to be able to call join in them, so we're going to wrap the joins in a run block, just like I did on lines 10 through 13. And that's going to tell us to wait for these to complete before actually returning any sort of value. As you can see here, now we have async. Um, however, we still get that issue where we're not actually returning a value. I, I uh, commented out the value because it's, there's no way to sum it, it's just a job. But because we can use job.join, it now waited, and we can see that now it's all async. So in order to get the actual value out of it, we can use async await. Um, async await is similar to launch, however, it refers, or returns a deferred object instead of the job. The deferred object can be awaited using uh, deferred whatever it is dot await, and that return that's similar to job dot join, and it will actually return value. So in our example, uh, we 
can replace this, and if we call job dot or slow, medium, and fast await on line ten, um, it will actually return ints. And so here you can see we replace uh, global scope with async or global scope dot launch with async, and we re-added that from blocking. The async returns deferred values. And deferred dot await will make sure that those values resolve before we actually move any further, it's because it's only one blocking block. So now, if we check our output, we see here. Okay, now we're running asynchronously. We got 10, 20, and 30 going, um, and our value is 60. So we're actually returning an actual value. And if we look at our duration, it's three mil three thousand milliseconds, so three seconds now, as opposed to the 4,200 change that we were receiving. That's the benefit of using async and await and actually wanting to return a value in our core routine functions. And from a web perspective, you can see how this is just a lot simpler, I guess. Um, we don't have to worry about any sort of views. We don't have to worry about um, you know, those specifics that probably come up more in Android. And we can just simply just do our calculations and return our values as if and there's not much extra code to add to make sure that it's doing what's its job. So here's a before and after. Um, you can see we've just all we've done so far is we've added our one blocking block. We've converted our calc functions into suspending functions, and now they're wrapped in an async call. And now we're just awaiting. So now that we have this all done, we got to make sure that our code is actually testable. So I'll uh, dive into some unit testing on this. So in order to unit test, we got to make sure that we include a few more dependencies. Uh, call the core routines test. Uh, mock K is something that we use a lot within our group, and JUnit for it's running your unit test. And there's your Gradle install as well. So make, making sure that you understand and know your core routine scope is extremely important for uh, making sure that your code is very testable. Mock K uh, is really helpful. It's we use it for mocking classes and uh, spying on things and capturing values that are called within functions. And the Kotlin core routine test library is used for helping speed up our tests. But we have to make sure that we're careful with it and making sure there's no bugs in it because it's still actually got a lot of uh, experimental features. As I pointed out, these annotations um, for my blocking test here. So before we actually get into testing our code, uh, we need to do a little bit of refactoring. On the top left here is what we had originally uh, at the end of um, converting it to coroutines, and what we got on the bottom right here is our refactored code. So in order to make this code mockable and spyable, we create a basic calculator class. And so we can call this within mock k to be able to say, OK, if we mock out this class, uh, every time it performs the calculation function, return this value. And if it, if it or for example, if it calls the calculate function, it's going to call then uh, that calc suspending function that uh, we also refactored. Etc., and then verify that certain things happen when those are called, and um, so on and so forth. Uh, you can see here uh, we, we have replaced run blocking with coroutine scope, and so we have also converted uh, our calculate function to suspending, but uh, we replaced it here because, we, like I said, I want to make sure that I keep my run blocking block as high up and uh, towards the main. Of, or the main as I can. And what that's going to do is it's going to allow us to, uh, it's going to not block the main thread while it's completing, waiting for all the trouble to be complete. And when we're doing this, we're going to be replacing our main thread with a tested thread. Um, so if we have multiple run blocks going on in there, we're going to have to make sure that none of those end up blocking our application. What I've seen is that if we have uh, run blocks within um, scopes, we run into the issue of um, tests basically freezing up and not moving any further forward because they're 
there's no way to tell it's not actually work unless you that kind of push into it. It just makes your tests really messy. So, like I said, calculators now been replaced with a suspend function uh, because the front block was now replaced with a coroutine scope. Coroutine scope does not bridge that gap between suspending and non-suspending functions. And then lastly, I had this actually return a value. Um, because why not? And then lastly, here's our main. Uh, you can see here it's the rub block is there, and basic calculator not calculate is not suspending, which is why we need it. So if we did not have run blocking in there, we would be running into compiler uh, errors. And here's two basic unit tests. Um, we have two that one or the, the top one is going to be calculating or just doing the basic calculate function. Um, it's going to be doing all three and making sure that the actual response from it is the correct value. And then the bottom one is making sure that calc is called three times and and if we were to do this um, without or we, or we would test this in a very similar way, whether it be coroutines or not in the web, but uh, because it's coroutine, all those suspending functions need to be wrapped in some sort of uh, suspended bridge between, the, the, uh, between those. So you can see from Kotlin uh, coroutines test, I'm using run blocking test. And what that's going to do is that's going to speed up our unit test. It's going to eagerly try and complete those tests before uh, like any sort of awaits or anything of those nature. Um, just a reminder that this is an experimental feature because this is still fairly new. But you can see that the duration is 17 milliseconds. Um, and if we go and replace that back with a normal run block, which we can do, um, it's just going to or it's going to impact the performance of it. So if I go to this test when I run these, you're going to see that it's taking 3,000 milliseconds for each test. So when you get you know 100 tests, each one running three seconds, it's going to it's going to add up. Now diving into mock K, uh, we can use it for mul multiple ways. Like I mentioned, spy K is a way to be able to uh, spy on, in on the functions of a class of any sort. So in this example, where it's pointing to, we see that's where we're going to start spying. It's still going to be uh, returning, or a spy k is still going to return the actual class of the object that it's spying on. So you can see that a basic calculator is still a basic calculator object. And then we use spy k's uh, co-verify, which allows us to assert that coroutines were actually called uh, with the correct parameters. So as opposed to a non-coroutine here, if we were to run this, if, if say basic calculator.calculate was not a suspending function, we could just use mod case verify, and that's about the only difference that we're seeing here. Um, mod k has uh, co-verify and verify, um, which basically one's specific for coroutines, as well, and one's not. So when it comes to the differences in tests, it's, it's very, very similar. Okay, and here's another example of a mocked class. So now I'm completely locking the class basic calculator, and I use co every and co answers to tell it what to do when it receives a certain call. So if I did not have lines 35 through 41 here, when I call uh, calculate on line 49, it's going to run into errors and saying, I don't know what to do. So that's the, that's the great thing about mock k is that I can tell it, say, okay, when you receive this sort of call to your function, calculate with x, y, and z values, do this, and, or respond this way. So that's where you see call every calculate x, y, and z, respond or answer with these three calc function calls. So when line 49 happens, it's going to call calc three times uh, with a certain time interval. And you can see here this test is also run, or this is also uh, on line 32. It's also a run blocking test because it's calling these async functions. Um, if we were to have that as run blocking test here, we would be running into issues with, um, or actually no, we would not. We would still, it's still bridging that gap between suspending and non-suspending functions. We'd have to make our test a suspending, a suspend function, which uh, I just wouldn't recommend. And just so you know, uh, 
So what this is asserting here on um, lines 45 through 47 is that when it calls a certain calculation, uh, it throws an exception. So this test is just, I don't have a lot of error handling in this demo, but normally you would have a little bit better error handling done in here. And so maybe instead of throwing an exception, you would be wanting it to checking and make sure that it throws a specific certain thing or it handles a certain way. Um, actually, another thing that I use is um, a functional programming framework. So instead of returning an exception or throwing an exception, it would return an either, which would be either a left or a right. So if it's correct, it returns the right value. If it's wrong, correct or answers to the left. And so you can test to make sure that it does those sorts of kind of things upon failures. All right, and so this is kind of what I explained here. So we have our uh, code every here that's basically telling it how to respond in certain circumstances. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, we've now tested and run through an example of converting a synchronous uh, piece of code to an async code. So what else is there? Uh, well, there's a lot more helper functions that we can use with async. Um, and diving in on those, um, we can use this little example here where we can check the status of async calls. So we have two do calcs here. And we can check and see when they're active. And we can yield and wait until one of them is completed. And so on line 36 there, that's another uh, piece of uh, what's included as part of the routines that you can do is when in a suspending function, you can call that yield and tell the program to basically say wait up until certain circumstances are met. Um, and so, continuing on in this little example, we can say, all right, well, if coroutine X is done, we can cancel coroutine Y. And we can make, check that by using is completed. And there's other pieces like is canceled and things of those nature. And so, yeah, there's cancel. And so this, in this example, this would be something that's racing. And I actually have another more advanced calculator that I'll be demoing off um, that has do, or does some similar kind of stuff as this. And lastly, a piece that I just found and I really enjoy is being able to name your coroutines. It definitely helps when it comes to logging out and debugging stuff. Um, there's a couple of extra pieces you got to add to your uh, to your uh, run configuration to get it to actually catch out the name of it. Um, but it's pretty handy at times. So we're going to dive in on this advanced calculator that I'm doing. So what I did is it's going to be basically performing the same tasks on a basic calculation calculator. On the right, you can see that it's still doing calc x, y, and z in the blue boxes. Uh, and those are running asynchronously. But you can see that it's also checking a cache database. And what it's going to be doing is it's going to be racing between two slow or those three slow calculations happening asynchronously, or checking to see if that calculation already happened and now was saved and exists in the core of that database to see um, to get the value. So uh, all this is mocked out and simulated in my code, but I just wanted to show this for presentational purposes. And then in our middle column, we have an authenticate and calculate async call. So we can see how there's two layers of uh, async going on in here. And say if a user isn't authenticated, obviously they would be returning the 401. Um, and, uh, but if they don't, they would eventually get return of actual value. And then on the far left here, uh, this is where it, it is web specific. And um, basically what's going on here is our main, what it does is it spins up a local HTTP server. And that opens up an endpoint where we can call and uh, interact with, with this application called Postman. So you can see our user on the bottom left of that a slice. It can interact with a get request to hit slash sum. And if it does, it's hopefully going to either authenticate them or not. And if it does, it's going to calculate and get a value back and eventually surface that back. Um, for those familiar, uh, HTTP or those unfamiliar with HTTP 4K uh, or, and are familiar with the web, it's kind of like running a Spring app, but it's very lightweight. We use it a lot within our group. It's really great for when you're trying to run serverless applications and you want to be able to have the ability to uh, run them on a container instead without minimal configuration. 
it spins up very quickly, unlike spring apps. And there isn't a lot of that spring magic, if anyone's uh, familiar with. So that, you know, things aren't just like auto wiring and just like appearing on you. Um, but you still can do a lot of the dependency injection and things like that that uh, you still get in Spring applications. So I used to be a firm believer that Spring is what is you know the best. And since we started using this, I've loved the flexibility of HTTP 4K. Um, how I can say, you know what, never mind, I want this running on a, a Lambda, and a serverless application, versus I want this running actually on a container. Um, it's been really helpful for those sorts of things. And it's very easy to configure, in my opinion. So I'm going to go in and dive in on this advanced calculator that I have. So I'm going to start from the bottom, and I'm going to start from the other direction from when I was explaining it at our main. And so our main just simply calls run locally. And so like I said, that's going to spin up our server locally on port uh, 8010. And we can interact with that in our routes here, which is going to instantiate a routes class, which is part of HTTP 4K. And that's going to tell us, this routes class is going to tell us what endpoints are available to actually can you make your code bigger? Yes. Oh, shoot. And let me do this too. Thank you for, for reminding me. Um, okay, so making sure we see this. So here's our run locally and our routes. And you can see our routes class here, which is going to be opening up those endpoints. And so now if I go to those routes, I have an invoke. So when routes is invoked, you, we have two endpoints here, sum and sum synchronous. The sum is going to be our asynchronous call to the service that uh, is going to be performing these calculations. And our sum synchronous is the synchronous version of that, which is much slower. And you can see when we call sum, it's going to be bound to a get request. So if we try to do a post request to slash sum, uh, it's going to return a uh, 404 not found. But um, if it's a get, we'll call the get rates async class here. And so this is going to check for a couple of query parameters that are part of our request. Uh, it's going to check for uh, X, Y, and Z for our calculation. And it's going to check for an authorization boolean and a cache boolean, which is just, um, it's a toggle that will have it fail or pass. Like say, if it, it is authorized as false um, in my query, or in my uh, get request, it's going to uh, fail. It's not going to do any sort of real auth. Um, so here's where we start to get into our coroutines. Um, we have our run blocking block, and this is as far up as we put it, um, and our coroutine scope. So we first build an authorizer, and we call its authorize function um, with its coroutine name, auth coroutine. And you can see here, uh, continuing down 131, we have authorized authorized, and it's going to just send in that query parameter that was defined here that defaults to true uh, on line 124. Our advanced calculator here is then next instantiated, uh, and we call async on that and give it its own name, and it's going to return a deferred just like uh, our auth will, and it's going to do our async calculation, which is part of our calculator class. And you can see here, again, I'm just passing in my query parameters uh, that were given as part of the request. And then I do a quick check here. I wait to see if it's authorized. And if it is, uh, it is not, uh, it's going to cancel our request to calculate and return an unauthorized response. Otherwise, it's going to say, OK, this is good, but I still need to await for my answer from the, the do calc async call on line 135 here. Lastly, I'm just doing some timing, and I'm printing out my uh, status value and the time time. So uh, let's go up to our uh, authorizer. You can see here, this is a very basic function. It's all it's doing is it's going to just call authorize, and it's going to say I start now, the latest amount of time, and then I have them all defaulting, so that you know this is going to take two seconds. Same thing, say you can see this all locked out. Um, it's not actually performing any sort of queries. I just want to, for the presentational purposes, just show you how this would react in these certain circumstances. Uh, we're going to skip our sync for now. And we're going to head up to our do async calc. So 
a little bit, but make sure you can still see it. That looks good. That looks fine. Um, so, like I said, these calc functions aren't actually performing any sort of calculation here. Uh, so I just, for the presentational purposes, also just do this on here. And we call uh, our first async fun function here, do calc. Excuse me. And so that is going to be our slow calculation. That's going to be going to all three, or firing off all three of those calc calls, those functions, and awaiting them, and essentially not checking our database. And this is just some extra code that I was putting in last second. I should have double checked this. <laughs> and our next piece is our cache query. And so this is going to be a very similar thing. It's just going to uh, it's going to check for a certain hash in our database that, you know, this is our very secure, you know, hard, or well-built hash here. And it's going to just tell us whether it's cached or not, which is still just being folded from our that uh, beginning query parameter. And then once it figures out, it's going to await both of them, just like I showed in my previous example in the slides. It's going to wait for one of them to finish and wait until one of those is done via the yield. And then decide on what to do when it is when it gets to continue one there. Um, you can say calc is completed, all right, so that means the slow function completed first, and we, the cache did not, so it beat the cache, uh, which would be rare, but uh, when that's done, you see here we run a global scope dot launch. And I actually grazed over this in my slides, but uh, we, want, we do want to try avoiding global scope uh, because it's going to execute and not hold up the main thread uh, until it's done like uh, a normal launch would do within its scope as long as you call a join. And so calling global scope here dot launch is more okay in web just because this service isn't just going to shut down as soon as it responds. It's not going to end what it's doing. It's going to continue performing any sort of background uh, tasks that it needs to do. So that's why I kept this as a global scope. I, I don't want this to cancel uh, or I don't want this to hold up the response and return back to my user. Uh, the, the goal here is to do this as quickly as I possibly can. And so that's what happens if the, uh, the calc continue, or completes first. And we're going to check the cache here too. And so if the cache completes first, uh, which is much more likely, uh, we make sure we get the value of it. And if the value, uh, if it returns a pair, which is um, the hash in the actual value. And so if the second piece of that pair is a negative one. I determined in just this example, that means that it was not found in my cache. So um, if it is not found, that means okay, that means we need to fire off the save again, and we need to make sure that we will wait for the calculation to complete now, and so we can save it and return that value to the user. Uh, lastly is a check this else here, is now we know that, okay, we found a cache value and we uh, we know that it's an actual value, it's not a, a 404 not found or something like that. And so we know that we can cancel the calc and we can continue, or we can get the completed value and return that to our user. And I didn't put an else here, negative one. That's what we went through, so that's like... Correct. Yeah. So it went through. Um, yeah. And you can put, uh, you could say if, instead of like went through, you could say like calc is complete. And then, you know, if it's not, then we know that it's uh, the cache that's first. For, for demo purposes. Yeah. So I'm going to slide over and do a request here to this service. I'm going to make sure it's running first. I actually shut it down before this thing. Are there any questions? We're running a little low on time. Oh, shoot. Sure. Um, I have a mic. I, this is, oh. and, and I helped you with this thing. I'm sorry about that. But. Please go ahead and run the example that you yeah. um, Question right here, see that? So uh, you start the activation before you authenticate the user. It means that you're setting up in this particular example for denial of service, right? Uh, if somebody not authorized, authenticated, uh, can send you a request and you will start the activation for each of them, even without authentication. So uh, you make a lot of work for user you don't know. So in, the, in that, this example, um, this is something I actually derived, or derived from something I directly worked on. 
But as we're uh, receiving requests, we want to keep building up that cache of saved values. So even if they're not authenticated, I want to make sure I save the request because my calculator is slow, and I want to make sure that you know, even still, I'm, I'm at least building up that cache more and more as I go. That's exactly why. Um, so, another question? No? I can quickly just show you um, the, you know, the before and after, but if you call some here, um, we have this gonna, it's not gonna find a cache, and it's gonna make sure that they're authorized by default, so you're gonna see it's really slow. Um, that took five seconds, but if I use my cache here, um, it's gonna find it, and actually, Real quick in my logs, um, before I click that next button, you can see here that it's returning to the user, return one, and it's returning an actual value, but then it continues to perform the task that it was going to do, save the cache. So you can see here it's going through and it's returning the user as quickly as it can, but it's taking those three or two extra seconds to save the cache. And then if I find a cached object, it's only going to take two seconds because it's going to cancel the calculation and an auth has already been performed and it's always going to make sure that that auth was done. And you can see here my code routines are named, so it's really nice for your logging and etc. So that concludes another it. question. Uh, so I have a quick question about the global scope. So you're saying that the global scope will keep running even if the program terminates. So for a long running application, well, that's not true. If the program terminates, then global scope will have to terminate. If the, if the other, if the, if the request ends. It will continue performing that global scope task until that's complete, because it won't shut down because it's you know containerized web application. It's not like a serverless lambda where it's gonna, uh, you know, it's gonna kill itself after it's done. Right no now. cancel. Yeah. Right. No cancel. Yeah, it won't cancel. So you're running the global scope when you want it to finish processing, but not necessarily lock in user. Continue to or the run lock won't wait for it to finish, but it still will eventually finish. Yes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Questions. All right, we got one more session before the coffee break.